voting on the voting on the approval of the minutes. Sharon. Yes. Christine. Yes. Thank you, Alex. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Yes. And Austin votes yes. yes. So we have no update from the town manager because the town manager is unable to be at this meeting. Uh, next item on the agenda, item four, is a finance update from Sean Mangano. All right. So um, a couple things, and again, sorry, I'm in a different space. Um, so Tim, are you gonna give, uh, I'm gonna go through a couple of things, invoices and uh, update on commissioning. But are, are you guys prepared to go through a budget update? Yes, we are. Okay, so I'll go through those two things first and then I'll turn it over to you to do the budget update, okay? Sure. Um, so yeah, we'll do a budget update in a minute. Um, commissioning, um, so we solicited some commissioning proposals back in January. Um, we received only one proposal uh, and that commissioning uh, process was based on the existing energy code. Um, now that we know we're going to be operating, operating under the new energy code, um, we're going to be re-soliciting uh, proposals and we've updated, we're updating the document now, we're going to go out next week uh, to get some new, uh, new uh, applications for that service. Um, so we'll keep this committee abreast of that process, but the new uh, commissioning RFP will be based on the new code and incorporate any requirements from the new code. Any questions on that? John, again, when will it go out and when will the proposals be, um, you know, what? when will they be returned or expected to be returned? Yeah, so I've been working with FAA and Colliers to uh, update the draft that we had sent for the, what we had sent that last time to reflect the new code um, and the new timeline. So um, hopefully if they get their comments back to me tomorrow, if any, um, it'll go out next week. And Great. we would uh, expect to have proposals back mid to late August and have a contract shortly after that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions about commissioning, the commissioning process? Okay. Sean, do you uh, want to now ask Tim to give the budget update? Uh, sure. Why don't you do the budget update first, Tim, and then I'll do uh, invoices. So we have quite a few. Um, okay, let me. Um, can I, I can share. I've got it up if you'd like. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Will. Uh, okay, great. Can everybody see the um, budget summary? Mm -hmm. um, so, our. Uh, You'll remember after our last meeting, we went through and talked about the where the estimates came in and that we were still targeting um, on to be on budget on the um, the, the newer budget based on the, um, the 46 million plus uh, budget number. Um, and so we've been working against that um, and paying uh, various um, expenses against that budget, primarily um, you know, design fees, OPM fees, and that sort of thing. So to date, we've um, total contract of 3.9 of the uh, $46 million budget. Um, you know, we're planning uh, 42.2 uh, million uh, going forward. Um, we are gonna be bringing on some additional consultants, uh, hazardous material, um, uh, consultant for doing uh, design work and then for also doing some uh, verification of testing of um, potential um, contaminants uh, within the building. Um, so that's something that's going to be coming up um, shortly. Um, and then as we go through the uh, permitting process with the town, if anything comes up, we'll um, uh, be addressing those. But um, overall, we're, we're still tracking to be on budget. Um, we do have an estimate coming up um, again shortly, and we'll be uh, again double checking and verifying that um, uh, things are still tracking to be uh, within our budget. And Tim, could you just remind us when the next uh, estimate is going to 
going to going to happen? Well, I don't know if you have our schedule, uh, but our seventy five percent um, we were targeting um, early October. Early October. Thank you. Starting October 9th, finishing at the end of October. Great. Where we have it right now. Great. Okay. Any questions on the budget that we've just seen? Uh, Sean. Uh, two things. Um, Sharon, could you, if you can mute the other me? That, there was a little feedback there. It might be because I have it on in my office because I wasn't sure if it was going to work here. Um, great, great. So maybe we the other me. That might be why there's feedback. Um, and then the other uh, two, two things related to this. So we are meeting weekly, um, Sharon and I, with the OPM and FAA um, to, to stay on top of the budget and the timeline. So those meetings are happening weekly and they've been really helpful. Um, and we'll keep this committee you know, informed of any. Um, you know, anything changes uh, that comes out of those meetings. Uh, but they're mostly just process and uh, sort of administration type meetings. Um, and yeah, and so I think I'm ready to go with the invoice unless there's any uh, other questions on the budget. Right, any other questions on the budget? Okay, Sean, let's, let's look at invoices. All right, so we do have uh, quite a few. All right, can you see that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think Austin, it probably makes sense to maybe approve these by um, by vendor because again, there's quite a few and um, okay. Just be, so, um, so for Collier's, we just have one invoice. It's for June services. Um, it's at the regular rate of seventy nine eighty four um, for the month of um, for. Most of June, if they have sort of a split um, service period, but it's the regular uh, monthly billing. So it's on it's on the schedule that we've been following. So if you remember, we uh, the latest schedule uh, worked through some contractual issue, uh, yep. uh, the contract to make sure it aligns with the new uh, the new schedule, and this is the version that does now align. Schedule. Okay. Uh, where there's a little bit longer design bidding phase, or, yep, uh, yep, structure yep. phase, and we're able to find some uh, efficiencies there. So, um, yep. So this is the new, the new okay. Uh, billing schedule. Okay, Sean. Uh, do you, uh, you want to sure. move the approval of that invoice? Yeah, I move uh, that the committee approve the June invoice uh, from Collins. Second. Thank you very much. Is there any question or discussion of the payment of that invoice? Okay, indicating your approval, Sharon? Yes. Christine? Yes. Thank you. Alex? Yes. Sean? Yes. And Austin? Yes. All right. Um, the next one is from RLD, who is our cost estimator. And this is for uh, when we bid out our cost estimating services, there was a fee for each of the three cost estimates that um, would be on the owner side. And so this is the second, uh, the second cost estimate that was done in design development at the rate that they did. Invoice is not yet visible. Uh, Hold on, I'll give a second. <laughs> Still not visible? Not visible. Let me try it again. Not yet visible, not visible. All right, so what I might do, Austin, is go back to my other computer. It'll take me a minute, but I'll pull it up on the other computer. I think it must be something to do with the uh, with this account. Um, give me 30 seconds, I'll go do that. 
אוקיי. While Sean is, is rushing to his other computer, uh, Ellen, do you just want to make sure, if you want to just invite your colleagues and team to introduce themselves? For, <clears throat> sure. So I'm Ellen Anceloni, uh, principal with Feingold yep. Alexander Architects. Do you want to call on the others? We only have one other. Josephine? Um, from Feingold Alexander, it's Josephine Penta, um, project manager. Right. Um, we also and, have Berkshire Design Group with us. Yeah, that's what oh, I was just going to ask. I'm Ra sorry, right? That's okay. That's a we, 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 Rachel, do you want to introduce yourself? Jess, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Rachel Leffler, principal at Berkshire Design Group. Jess Schoendorf, uh, landscape designer at Berkshire Design Group. Thank you. Thanks very much. And as usual, we are joined by our two good colleagues from uh, Collier's, uh, Will and Tim. Okay, uh, Sean. All right. Um, Sharon, can you enable um, screen sharing for the other Sean? Sean number two? Yeah. All right, now can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is the RLB invoice uh, for the second cost estimate for $14,000 that was done in May. And I take it with all these invoices, this is what the expected cost was. This is what we're paying. There's no deviation from the expected yeah, cost. Yeah, so all, all of the invoices get reviewed and approved by Collier's first. Great. And then this one in particular is there was a... a, a invitation for bid that we did or a quote that we did for three bids yep or for three cost estimates sean do you want to move approval i move to approve the uh invoice from rlb second thanks any questions or discussion about that invoice okay voting to approve sharon yes christine yes thank you alex yes thank you sean Yes. And Austin votes yes. All right, back to me. Sure. All right, um, so now we're getting into FAA. And there, this is where we get a little confusing and I had everything queued up <laughs> on the other computer. Um, all right, so the first, uh, the first invoice here hopefully that you see on your screen is for the month of April. Um, this is from FAA and it is for um, uh, design development. And so it's 81,750 for this, their services and design development in April. And the second one is, uh, sorry, this one here is for the month of May for design development. So these two invoices combined um, finish out the design development phase. Um, and we, at the last meeting, we moved to construction documents. Anything else from FAA, John? I think it'll be cleaner if we just do it by um, by service, because again, there's gonna be a bunch of other invoices okay. that I'm gonna kind of group by what they're for. So these are the two invoices for April and May for um, FAA for uh, design development and for basic services. Okay, and you move approval? I move approval for the May, April and May invoices right. to FAA for design development. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay, any questions or discussion of those two FAA invoices? Okay, uh, to approve, Sharon. Yes. Christine. Yes. Alex. Yes. Sean. Yes. And Austin votes yes. All right, the next one is also FAA. And this is for renderings. So way back when this yep. group authorized um, FAA to do a number of renderings, uh, we got the cost down quite a bit, down to $9,000 to do um, the, the renderings that they worked out mm -hmm. uh, with Sharon and the, the rest of the group. So this is that bill for those renderings. 
Uh, John? I move to approve the, the rendering invoice. Thank you. Second. Okay, any discussion or question about this invoice? All right, Sharon? Yes. Christine? Yes. Alex? Yes. Sean? Yes. And Austin, yes. Okay. So these next two are for the FF &E consultant. <laughs> um, this is a service coordinated through um, Feingold Alexander, but it is a separate, um, it is a service that isn't covered in their base contract. Um, you may remember we had a presentation a little bit while ago with, um, I'll say the name, I'll pronounce it wrong, but Stifura, is that how we say it, Ellen? Okay. Um, so this is for uh, April and May services um, to the furniture consultant. So the um, April invoice is for seven thousand five hundred and six dollars, yep. and the May invoice is for six ninety two. Okay, Sean, I move to approve the April and May invoices uh, to uh, for furniture consulting. Great. That second. Any questions or discussion of these two invoices? Okay, Sharon. Yes. Christine. Yes. Alex. Yes. Sean. Yes. And Austin votes yes. All right. And there's one more group that I just got to find because it's three invoices. All right. Um, last screen share. So the, the next batch of three invoices is for permitting services. So um, FAA has started meeting with the various boards and committees mm -hmm. um, to go through the permitting process. Um, again, that was not included in their base contract. So there's a uh, fee for every meeting that they go to um, to move this through, which is again, one of the reasons why we've worked with them to try to streamline these meetings as quick as, as much as possible um, yep. where, where, where it is possible. Um, so the first one is for $2,000 for um, uh, disability, Access, uh, access yep. advisory committee. Yep. Uh, that's for April services. For May, um, there is uh, for the uh, Amherst Historic Commission, or is, it the, is that what it is? AHEC yep. Historic Commission. Yep. yep. And then that's for May. And then for June um, is the uh, second half of the, I think they had two, two meetings, Ellen. Is that correct with the Disability Access Committee? Yep. So it's a total of $6,000. For these three months, um, for the work they've started to do for permitting, the total estimate for the permitting process is twenty thousand dollars. So um, yeah. they're billing us as they move through. And do you so, just want to do you just want to remind everybody who's attending the meeting? DRB is design, design review, design review board, um, PRB. I assume that's planning board, design um, review. Oh, P. Sorry. Do, yeah um and then the zoning board of approvals if needed um so this is part of again one of the reasons why we've been meeting weekly is to coordinate this yep. permitting process because every one of these uh boards we have to get on their meeting schedule and um uh, faa has to get all the materials to them in, in advance by so many weeks um and there's there's numerous sort of channels that have to be worked through simultaneously so um so that's part one of the reasons why we're doing those coordination meetings great so I move uh, approval of the April, May, and June invoice, uh, invoices for permitting. Second. Discussion of those invoices. Okay. Sharon? Yes. Christine? Yes. Alex? Yes. Sean? Yes. Austin votes yes. Sean, do you have anything else? That is it. Thank you. So before we move on, I just want to say uh, how grateful I am uh, for the work that Sean Mangano uh, does every day for this town. Uh, I want to express special gratitude for all the work that he has uh, put in uh, to help with the Jones Library uh, project. Uh, what we are doing 
I think uh, we could not have done and gotten to this point without Sean's commitment, expert guidance, and occasional but only occasional good humor. Uh, we are extraordinarily grateful uh, to have had Sean's uh, work with us. And I just wanted to, to, to take a moment uh, to say that and to celebrate Sean. Thank you. Uh, so I appreciate it. Um, we'll work through on our side to make sure there's no, um, you know, gap in service where we have everything kind of lined up. Um, so it, when it's not me, it'll be somebody else that will step in and do that role. So I appreciate it, though. Well, we're, we're grateful. OK. Next is Collier's. Tim, Will. Um, so, Will, I don't know if we have anything to, to share on the screen or if you just want to think about some of the things we've been going through with the permitting process. I do. I've got a or two. One second. I can quickly talk big picture. Is that that showing correct? The schedule? Yep. So quickly, uh, milestone, big picture schedule. This should look almost identical to last month. None of our milestone dates have changed. Uh, we're still progressing through the construction documents as planned um, to meet that mid-November deadline set by the MBLC. Um, the only change you'll see down at the bottom are temporary space. Um, that secure space period has been pushed out a bit. Um, and I believe, Sharon, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Paul Bockelman has taken the lead on securing hopefully one space for the library to use as a temporary location. Correct. But besides that, as we mentioned earlier, we have our cost estimate happening in October of this year um, and getting started to bid the documents and get um, a contractor on board at the end of 2023. Any questions? Okay. And then I wanted to touch on that permitting process Sean just alluded to, um, and this is something we touch on weekly. Hopefully this is large enough for everyone to get the idea, but um, we're right here on this red line and we have um, three major groups, we'll call them, to meet with the Historic Commission, the Design Review Board, and the Planning Board. Um, we are currently FAA, uh, along with Berkshire Design, is in the process of preparing the two packages that have to go to the Historic Commission and the Design Review Board. Um, both the Historic Commission asked for three weeks to review the documents before we meet, so we're targeting to be on their 9-5 or 9-12. They haven't determined which meeting we'll be on or which date they'll be having the meeting. So we'll be submitting our package to them uh, here in early August or we're target, targeting the 8th. Design, okay. review, design review board. Um, don't need quite as much lead time to review the documents. So we have a, we're preparing the package to submit to them for review uh, by the 14th of August with our meeting on the 28th of August at 5 p.m. with the Design Review Board. And this will then carry into the next phase, which is the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Approval Appeals, rather. Yeah. So that is where we are at right now with the just, just hold on. Just yes. hold on one sec. Any questions yeah. about these uh, this permitting process? Okay. Thank. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And with that, that is all 
Collier's has. Um, I will turn it over to Fine Gold Alexander um, to either, I believe, I don't know which was first on the agenda, the land <laughs> or the energy code update, but. Uh, landscaping is first on the, on the, is just above on the agenda if you want to start with that. That would be great. We'll let Rachel and Jess take it over. Um, Sharon, do you want to talk first? Yeah, uh, so I, I just wanted to do a little intro about, mm -hmm. you know, how we've gotten to this point. Um, uh, last week, George uh, Hicks Richards and I, uh, we invited some members of our gardens advisory committee to meet with the landscaping team just in or so that we could hear their, their thoughts, their feedback. Um, so much goes into a good landscape plan. And so we we talked about all sorts of different things. So um, I just want to rattle off some of the uh, some of the concepts that that have gone into this plan, you know, climate change. So we have to choose plants that can handle the heat and the rain. Mm -hmm for example, today. Um, uh, lots of discussion about where to put the trees versus the bushes versus ground cover. Um, we have to, we want to eliminate plants that are prone to disease. <coughs> We're looking for low maintenance plant material. Uh, we want to choose plants that establish easily and quickly so that it, you know, fills in. Uh, being aware of the plant height and sight lines uh, is really important. Seeding, um, you know, we really want to create spaces where people can stop and pause. I thought that was lovely. Uh, Stormwater flow out back. Um, that's a, a bit of a beast to deal with. Uh, and, you know, there's a difference between the front yard the purpose and the backyard, the purpose of. And we even talked about color palettes, which was a lot of fun. Um, anyway, so I thought uh, all of that, hours and hours and hours worth of work, I thought now I'll hand it over to Rachel to get to the specifics. Great, Sharon. Thank you. Great. Um, and by the way, before you start, Rachel, again, we want to express our gratitude to the garden advisory people who have been incredibly helpful for a long period of time. Okay, Rachel. Thank you. And, and Sharon, thanks for organizing that meeting. That was really helpful to get some of that feedback. Um, as, as, as Sharon said, there were some plants on our plant list that um, folks on the committee had had uh, personal experience with that um, that changed our discussion. So what I'll, what I'm going to do is kind of show you the big picture overview that we discussed with them um, and, and, and talk about our next steps with that. In addition, um, we have a design update for the north entry. That's the entry out back um, okay. that includes more seating area. So we'll, we'll go through that. So we started out talking about uh, trees that we might use generally on the site, um, trees that could handle climate change impacts and that were um, in the category of shade or more ornamental. Um, we heard that the paper bark maple, um, some folks had had difficulty getting those to establish quickly. So that's one that we eliminated from our list. Um, folks really loved the yellow magnolia. We're thinking about that one as two signature trees to be planted out front, kind of like tokens <laughs> to the library. Um, and we also heard that uh, some of the, another tree, Amelanchier, which is which is loved and local, um, Shabos service fairy, um, tends to look a little scryly that's on its own. So if we're thinking about that, we wanna think about it as a mass planting, like several planted together. We touched on a lot about the shrubs at the front, of the library. Um, there was pushback that 100% evergreen was maybe not desired. And um, one of the members highlighted the fact that the library has a perception of the landscape as a garden. Um, and how can we kind of keep the garden-like feel without making a maintenance headache? So maybe there, maybe where we can find shrubs that flower and shrubs that maybe even look a little, a little, um, little, quiet or a lot more quiet in the winter um, that may lose their leaves in the winter, but have that seasonal change may be preferential than 100% evergreen in the in the front areas, especially. <laughs> um, boxwood was one that a member had mentioned that they had had experience with boxwood blight, so we're going to take that off the list. So we might be looking at, um, and then sight lines too in the parking lot areas, so um, mm -hmm. we're taking these off the list also. 
So we're looking at things that are low, um, maybe in a four foot height, maybe something like the oak leaf hydrangea in the parking lot area, and then maybe um, some low rhododendrons that max out at four foot high in the front that have that flowering quality um, and a little bit of evergreen, but but again, wouldn't be uh, wouldn't require trimming by by, this, by staff or volunteers. Um, we also talked about kind of the character that we wanted, the front and back being kind of separate character. So the front, we're gonna keep a really limited color palette uh, with a little bit of yellow for the magnolia and purples and whites, um, and then the evergreen borders. So again, a restrained color palette for the front. Um, and then in the back, so the front areas, these are where the two magnolia trees would be proposed. The shrubs that would be less than four feet high or less. Um, we're moving to more a shorter height shrub in this area. And then we heard feedback that also the there's a pagoda dogwood and a Chinese dogwood back here that are really overgrown and kind of scraggly. That um, was mentioned was like kind of makes this a, a you know block views and it's not a great place to sit under. Um, one of the trees we're going to be removing the existing tree and then quite, and we're going to look at the other tree and see if um, maybe there's a tree that's more appropriate for, for use in that space. So this, these are some examples of that we talked through with um, also ground covers in the area. And then more seasonal color. Mm -hmm. uh, Low grow, low grow sumac um, is a short, short ground cover that does have some seasonal color that might be interesting to incorporate. Um, and again, the the oak leaf pine range and the parking area might be nice. And then in the back, we were thinking um, it is an area that in the stormwater assessment, that whole area in the back now receives stormwater runoff from the historical society property, even though it's more raised up and, and has undulating terrain, um, that is where the stormwater goes from the, from the neighborhood. Um, in addition, we are going to be putting a stormwater structure in that area. So it's an area that tends to be a little bit more shaded, tends to be a little bit more wet. And so we're thinking of a different kind of character back there inspired by a, a woodland edge garden um, using things like moss and ferns, um, some perennials, a lot of carex, which looks it's the image here on the right. Um, and there's 3000 species of carex, but the carex is um, a sedge, it's a type of grass, but that you don't have to mow. Um, so that plus some sedums, which is another type of ground cover, but again, don't require mowing or maintenance um, to kind of fill out the ground plane. In that area, um, we had this lighter color would be the low ground cover area. And then this lighter green area is the area where um, we anticipate the most water from runoff to be. So that would be an area that would love the more rain garden type plants. But again, the low profile in that six to 12 inch range. Um, and then we talked about proposed trees. Some, there's some desire to add another shade tree in this area if we could. And we're looking right now to see if we can fit it in with the size of the stormwater system that's required. Um, so some examples um, of different types of trees. So like the swamp white oak with, um, really does love what what feet, so does the willow oak, those might be trees to again, um, continue that uh, dialogue of shade in the back area long-term. Those will also handle um, warmer warmer climbing temperatures. Um, some evergreen ferns. And then um, it was suggested that maybe we consider things like witch hazel um, and plethora also add to this palette, some other natives um, in, in this area. And again, we also are looking at different types of mosses and sheet moss that we can get from a nursery to use instead of mulch in some of these areas um, to kind of, again, trying to reduce the maintenance required for, for these areas. And then um, we've been looking at color palettes of bulbs and some native, native plants that, again, that are in that shorter profile um, with a dispersing seasonal color from spring until fall. Mm -hmm. 
and some some more examples of sedums and other other perennials and some of the rain garden plants that we would expect to thrive in that area. Mm -hmm. And more examples of the carrot. So we'll be playing with the colors, the colors and texture. So our our um, marching orders from the group was to really think about the garden, trying to maintain a garden kind of feel while balancing the need for open sight lines, while balancing the need for low maintenance um, and rapid, you know, rapid establishment. Um, and then uh, a call out to edges, the, making sure to take care of how we, what plants we place at the edges so that it looks like it is well intentioned and loved um, throughout the garden. So I think that's that's our next step is to take this feedback and then um, put each plant in its place on the on the plan in the back. And then the seeding, we. Um, I think that's gonna tie into what I'm gonna talk about next. Does anyone have any questions about the planting discussion at this point? Uh, I, I have a question just to start. Uh, how do you go about thinking about when you say plants that'll do better in warmth or rain or something like that, how do you do that anticipating that over a 40 or 50 year period, the climate is likely to get whatever it's likely to get? Or yeah. is that not something that one can do at this point? Um, we can make our best guess. So um, it's almost like the way an arboretum is approached to, like you look at the, you look at where you're going to plant. And if you're, say, if you're on the north side of a slope, it's gonna be a little bit cooler yep. than on the south side of the slope. Um, so then each plant has a, a zonal range that they thrive in. So <laughs> Um, we're in zone, right now we're in zone five. We may be zone seven in, a, in 20 years. Um, so we're picking plants that thrive now from zone five to zone eight, rather than uh -huh. knowing that if we were to pick a plant that thrived from say zone three, further up mm -hmm. north mm -hmm. to zone five, um, that really preferred that colder air, that colder climate, they would, they're going to really struggle in 20 years. So we're finding plants that work, that live well in the south right now, as well as the northeast, the southeast and the northeast. So if the plant can, can live and thrive in the southeast right now, we know that it'll do, we know it's a pretty good bet it'll be able to thrive in, in 20 or 30 years here as the climate changes. Um, and then you know, every every tree we have books and resources, websites, um, information too on each individual plant and its tolerance for moisture in the soil profile. Um, mm -hmm. There are some plants like red maple who who really don't care. They they can handle the drought. They can handle the wet soils. And other plants that like rot like rhododendron, which are great for the front where it's dry, um, really do not like wet feet. So that's a plant we would not be putting in the back because it, it really couldn't handle those that water water situation. Okay. And then um, Alex, before I just got one other question. Rachel, as you narrow down these choices, you're gonna come back to the committee. We're gonna get a chance to look like we're gonna look at this one rather than there are five different varieties of it. Right. Is that right? Right. Okay. Thank we you. Wanted, we wanted to start here. Yep. Um, and so that if there was a redirection needed that we could start here from the big view right. yep. before picking final selections. Thank you. Alex. Um, thank you. Um, this all looks lovely. And I really, really appreciate you working with our garden advisory committee and, and taking their feedback. Um, um, to, I guess two things. One, um, if we're replacing the pagoda, I just, again, want to be <clears throat> really mindful of whatever trees we add that we're not looking at, you know, roots going into foundation and those kind of like, I, I know we're fine now, but I want to be thinking like 50 years down the road. So I'm sure you're doing that, but I would feel remiss if I didn't just set that reminder out there. Um, and then I also, Austin, I don't know, but I just want to acknowledge that we, we do have some of our, our neighbors who were kind enough to join us from um, uh, the, the Historic Museum next door, um, as well as I see some members of the Garden Advisory Committee in our attendees. So I don't know if anyone on the committee 
is interested, but I just wanted to point out that they're there. If we wanted to invite them in, I just wanted to open that opportunity to the group that people were there. Uh, okay, that makes sense. So if anybody among our participants, our attendees rather, would like to make a comment at this point, please raise your virtual hand. Okay, I see a couple of folks. So Sharon, do you want to bring in uh, Georgia first? Great. Okay, Georgia. Okay. Um, I just want to say that it's um, very exciting to see the plant materials and hear the plans and see the palette. I Looks lovely. I wish you'd come and do my yard. Um, <laughs> I also want to just um, throw out that the Historical Society will probably in the next couple of years think about redesigning our own garden. And um, I look forward to working with your landscape team perhaps in the future to make sure that we don't have an unsightly <laughs> backyard for you all to deal with too mm -hmm. and we've been using our garden more and more for programming we actually had an inquiry today from the jones to use our yard in august um and i i hope these collaborations will continue um you know whether it's for musical events or poetry readings or what have you i mean the outside environment will be beautiful and we should all make good use of it but that's all I have to say. But thank you. It's been no, thank really thank you. And the collaborations that you talk about are, I think, very exciting to right. contemplate, and certainly very exciting for the Jones Library. So we we'll, we we'll look forward to uh, collaborating as we go forward, and to making sure that our our garden choices don't clash. How's that for a? Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Good. Thank you so much. Thanks for attending. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Charlie. Charlie, if you would unmute. Charlie has disappeared. No, Charlie's still there. Charlie's actually Melinda. <laughs> okay. Well, whether it's Charlie or there Melinda. There, there we go. go. Thank you very, okay. very much. Thanks. Yeah, I'm I'm using my husband's computer because That's something okay. went wrong with mine. So um, I wanted to say, Rachel, I thought these uh, plant choices were really lovely <laughs> and appropriate uh, for the uh, uh, conditions that you're discussing. I do feel like in that front area where the pagoda dogwood would likely be removed, because that is a southern facing face of the library. And I agree with Alex, we don't want something where the roots are going to interfere, but I would just advocate anywhere where we can put a shade tree, we should. Uh, because, you know, a shade tree, it gets tall. It doesn't necessarily, I mean, there are trees now that, you know, are like 30 feet tall. I mean, there's a lot of trees that work in a sort of an urban <laughs> environment. And I just feel like they give a ceiling, they give some shade. And as we know, shade is just becoming a premium. Um, so I feel like that space with some shade would really provide a, a really wonderful kind of area for people to sit and cool off, et cetera. And so I say that versus like an ornamental tree. Yeah. Yeah, we heard a request too to have places that people, someone could sit underneath the tree and make sure we have spaces for that. So that would, yeah. that would align with what you're talking about too. Yeah, yeah. So that was all I had to say on yeah. that. Well, again, thank you. Thanks so much for coming and thanks for your, your help. Sure. Okay, Bob Pam. Mm -hmm. I appreciate, can you hear me? Yes, Bob. Good. Um, I appreciate what's being done, which is a naturalistic rear yard uh, with respect to plantings and stone. And I uh, will reiterate what I've said before, which is that the hardscape 
um, with respect to the bridges might be improved by having a small arch to the bridges so that it is in um, it is congruent with all of the other work that is being done back there. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Okay, Rachel, anything else? Yeah, um, wanted to update you on the, or thinking in the rear entry. Great. Um, where we, where we last, the plan you last saw, this is an enlargement of where, where the plans that you've seen to date. Um, so this is the north side of the library. The CVS parking lot is up this way. Uh -huh. um, this is the new north entry. And we had um, <coughs> a, a patio area of working tables, stone benches, bike, bike parking, an accessible walkway that goes up the side of the library. Um, and then we have a site retaining wall that maintains the property line between the historical society and the library. So previously, there is a change in grade in this back corner. Um, the entry is lower, uh, about eight feet lower than the grades on this side of the building. And the way we have, and this is a cross section. So now this would be a view as if you're looking at, at this back face of the library. Uh -huh. This is the rear entry. Uh, <laughs> this is the level area of, of lawn adjacent to that. And then we had a sloped, um, a little like a four to one slope um, up to meet the level. Uh, so that's what that design looked like before. We heard feedback that there was desire to make this space more usable, yeah. um, that more seating areas and types of seating areas out back would be preferable. Um, so we started looking at um, what would happen if we actually extended this flat area further along the face of the, of the library and introduced terrace steps. So these are, currently we're showing steps that are two feet, 21 inches high and two feet deep. So this would be um, not traditional stairs, but these would be steps that you could you know, lean against and sit with a book or with a friend um, at the end of the space, but then um, it'd be up to, up to the, in what you guys would recommend in terms of you know, we could continue the railing across the top here to totally block off access and circulation, or we could leave the railing here. Um, by code, it would not be needed. Um, we could leave this open and that if there was an issue, um, folks could could walk out of the garden that way. Um, but we were thinking, as we started looking at this, we realized there was an opportunity to sort of expand this, this patio area at the entry. Um, expand it to about, it's about 10 feet wide, and then um, use crushed stone with a binder so it meets ADA requirements. So it have a, have a, like makes a sound when you walk on it. Um, it's a different texture, it's a different zone um, with movable chairs and a catenary lining. And I'll show you, this is what I'm talking about. So um, because the swall is, the swall is already high and the and the railing here is um, four feet above already a three foot and a five foot high wall. It almost is the space of a, you know, it has a height of a room with like a, like a canopy. And so we look, are thinking we could actually kind of make it a really warm place to hang out um, in the day and the evening by introducing catenary lights, it's a fancy word for like string lights. Um, above this space, uh, so about at that, that about that level of um, that line on the building, and we can we can talk with we can work as a team to figure out exactly what where this needs to go and on the elevation. Um, but we'd have poles that were integrated with the wall to suspend the lights on on the side of the wall, and then it would string back and tie into the building, um, really kind of making this an outdoor room. We were thinking with the crushed stone and the movable chairs um, that then this could be configured um, in different ways for different groups or different experiences. Um, some precedents, um, Jess mentioned our office, Paley Park in um, New York City. It has a, it's a small space, but it feels, um, and with a tall wall, but it 
you know, having vines growing on, introducing vines to this wall could also kind of make it green for, for that community room when you're looking out, looking out through the, the glow of the lights and then a green, a green wall. Um, we were thinking to uh, the, a vine that could grow on here. We we're looking at um, some varieties of clematis that actually grow down. So we could plant that at the top of the wall and let that grow down or even like a climbing hydrangea that could handle, it's gonna be more shady here. Um, we're looking at varieties of vines that could, could handle the shady conditions. But again, something that would start to create green and maybe some flowering interest on the wall. Um, and then we would still need a railing along the wall on this side, side of the space. Um, so those are some thoughts of how to make this uh, more of a usable space than what was there before. I just want to make sure, I want to ask Sharon before you do anything else. Sharon? Yeah, uh, so some of this is new. We didn't get to see this last week. If you could actually make those steps usable to over, uh, you know, to the stronghouse property, that would be spectacular. That would be really great. And I don't think the world has enough twinkle lights. I think that would be really, really pretty, a great place to do things, whether small or who knows. And um, there was a third thing that I wanted to say, but thank you for that. Great. Alex? Thanks. Um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate the, the sort of pinch point where it's uh, you know five feet across. Uh, it's the property lines. There's nothing we can do about it, but I that space has always in me been kind of the most uncomfortable entry point. And so I appreciate this new design. Um, and you know, after hearing Gigi talk about the collaborations that we're doing, having these steps, you know, again, if we can work with a strong house in a way where, you know, I, I keep foreseeing this entrance possibly becoming the main entrance for many people, especially as it's sort of the community space of the building. And so I think to the extent that we can make passing back and forth between the two buildings um, make sense for the strong house as well as for us and the community. I, I think that's fabulous. So thank you. Great. Great. Christine. Yeah, I agree with everything that Sharon and Alex was saying. <coughs> I, I think it would be a great space. And I just, at one point I heard it mentioned, you could put a railing at the top. I want to encourage that it is an open space, just rather than a dead end space, because if the, like, the library was closed or something, it, it could feel kind of um, not as secure as some right. people would like. So keeping it open, I think is good. Thank you. Okay. Austin, can I say one thing? Uh, sure. I uh, just, we will look at the idea of making those proper steps, but I, I think it's not an easy task, but we will look at it. You want to say, when you say it's not an easy task, just say well, another couple of sentences. Well, I just think it's just, it's going to extend the length uh -huh. of the, of the steps. And we would have to investigate, uh, and Rachel would know this maybe, quicker than I, does it have to be accessible? Because if it does, that won't work. But we will look at it. I think that would be an interesting idea. And then I don't know if this is a question for you, Ellen, or for Rachel. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about money. Yeah. So does the design change that we're talking about, how does it affect the, the budget? This one we we did talk about it with Rachel and we um, it's not huge, but once you start getting stairs and then you're going to need railings on the stairs yeah. and yeah. then a pathway from the stairs that does get expensive. I can't tell you the number, but I, I think we'll do a little digging on our side, Austin, to give you guys a better, better sense of what we can do and just to, just to guess on what a cost would be, because we know that costs are are you know critical good because we want to make sure that we're not saying you see this is really great and then we're going to have to look again and say but we can't afford it correct so knowing what the cost implications are would be would be great um 
I, I, I'm seeing hands. I don't know whether Melinda slash Charlie is still in the, uh, is that a new hand or a leftover from the old hand? It looks like a new one. It just popped up. Okay, Melinda. Right, yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, yes, I wanted to say that I, I think that this space itself has a lot of potential because of the the fact that people are coming in and out and to uh, you know really create a place where people can sit and be would be great. I also agree if those could be made into steps, uh, that would be ideal. But if if cost, if it's cost prohibitive, et cetera, I still think that this second solution versus just having earth, having these, uh, what, uh, these, uh, what are we calling them? Terrace steps is, is a really good way to solve that problem. And it just seems to me, and I'm just going to throw this out there because, and I know it's, you know, controversial, but I'm just someone who's been observing this, that it, if there was, <laughs> If we're if the Amherst History Museum and the Jones Library somehow wanted to integrate in some way, it just seems like that wall would be the place yeah. to do that. And yeah. instead of having this six and a half foot wall, could this be a terraced wall that begins back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a little further and terraces down? And so suddenly these two the Amherst yeah. History Museum up yeah. here and the Jones Library down here become integrated because it's terracing down from mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. point. So yeah. it I just think it's something that I know it's there are many aspects that might throw that out, but um it's just something to really think about because it would get rid of this point. Uh, and it could just create a really elegant integration of these two mm -hmm. sites while still letting each site have their own integrity. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that mm -hmm. uh, suggestion. Rachel, you want to say anything about the terrace wall possibility? I think it's a lovely idea. I mean, it, ex it expands. I think the, it will feel this point will feel really compressed. And I think it also increases program space for both mm -hmm. the library yep. and the historical uh, society. Yep. It also reduces safety. Any, you know, it helps keep sight lines open to the back door from up here, from over mm -hmm. here. Um, anytime you have that, you know, a really a really big wall that it, it reduces visibility. I think it just opens up the space in right. so many ways. Um, so you will, awesome? you'll, you'll give it some thought on how to accomplish it. Well, we'd love, we love to design it. I, I, how, how do we get permission to, to consider it? Like, it's a, it's a legal thing. A legal as in whose property it's on? Correct. Right. No. Yes. So this line right here is the edge of the property line for the library. Uh-huh. Um, and this white space is the historical society property. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Uh, Alex? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, just... Alex. No, if you just hold off. Christine's been waiting. Christine? Oh, it was related to this, what we were just discussing, not something new. Um, if you just hold off, just sure. wait, wait, wait one second. Uh, Christine has been waiting patiently. Christine? Thanks. Um, so still related, I am concerned about it sounds great but we just brought up cost and mm -hmm. to expand it even more and what kind of timeline would that entail and we don't even know if the would the historical society even be interested in that kind of thing and could they contribute any more? Mm -hmm. it's a good question okay alex yeah i was just gonna say we have <laughs> We have the chair of the Historic Society board in our in our attendee. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, I I think probably one the question would be would they be interested? Two would be what kind of timeline would they need to make any decisions? And then obviously they'd want to know what kind of cost. But I see Gigi had her hand raised, so she could speak for herself probably about it if she wants to. But those were kind of my thoughts. Okay. Hi. Um, 
So I can't, I can't speak for, of course, the historical society without the board having to weigh in on it. But you know, our board is is small. We meet monthly. We can make decisions quickly. Um, do we have the financial resources to invest? Absolutely not. Um, but our our gardens, the the two. Um, Formal garden beds are managed by the Garden Club of Amherst. And from time to time, Denise Gagnon has said, you know, we we could go to the, you know, the National Garden Club has grants. And it could be that through through the uh, Garden Club of Amherst, we could find some money. Um, so I think the proposal, uh, proposal seems great to me. Yeah. Um, but I think the initiative is going to have to, you, you all are going to have to take some initiative if you want to see this happen. Um, and we need to coordinate so that we're not held up or delayed by that kind of consideration. I see Sean Mangano. Sean? I think Alex is first. Um, awesome. uh, Alex? Oh, I don't see Alex. Sean? <laughs> Sorry, um, just along those lines of what we just said, Austin, um, Rachel, is that something if we didn't want to, you know, if, from a cost perspective and a time perspective, it's not something we could do as part of this project? Um, it sounds like it may be something we could do in the future if we wanted to. Uh, are we, are we in that wall there? Is that anything that, are we building a new wall there? Or is that we're keeping the existing wall or building a new wall? Yeah, it's a new wall. Um, it is a new wall. So it would be, I think the the most cost effective for the town would be to have the new, yeah. whatever new be what you want your your ultimate thing or or ready for for it. So another option could be um, would be to slope to cut the cut the grades here. And make a, a temporary slope to hold space for a future terrace wall. So instead of having this wall retain the earth mm -hmm. straight up and down, mm -hmm. sloping back towards the historical property um, and having space for that terracing and stepping down, so that we'd be able to have the grades lower here and here and the grades higher here and here, but have an in between state. Another thing we might do is we could have this as a base bed. Actually, we could have the, the grassy area as a base yeah. and have this as an alternate and then the terrace option as another alternate for pricing. I don't know, Will, what do you think about this, about that? Um, I think including it as an alternate to not necessarily, it gives us more flexibility costs estimating wise for sure um which may you know come down to be a deciding factor so i think including include what you want in the drawings and then we should carry an alternate if that does not work out well i i think we need to explore this a little bit before we say just include what you want in the drawings um yep. we just we want this is a fabulous idea. Great. It would be so nice because we always were pinched right there. Um, it may be a, a, a meeting that we have with um, Rachel and Jess, figure out what we could do and then present it to, to the group. Um, right. Because keep in mind, when we do alternates, you have to take the alternates like one, two, three, four. You can't take alternate four unless you take one through three. So it's tricky in what our alternates are. So I think we can do a little strategizing and then come back to you guys with our thoughts on that. That makes a lot of sense. And again, we we are, um, you know, it is a great idea, but as I'm just thinking about it, I really want to make sure that we're not going to increase our design costs now because we got to go back and do some significant redesign. So if you, Alan and Rachel and Jess, if you could put your heads together mm -hmm. 
let us know. We'll share that with uh, with our, our good colleagues and friends at the Historical Society. If people in the Historical Society want to explore it from their end, realizing that we may not be able to accommodate it either time or cost wise, then that seems to me to be a reasonable process. Okay, are we good with that? Yeah, sounds mm -hmm. good to me. Okay, I've got another hand up here. And again, I don't know whether this is a new hand or an old hand. So, uh, Melinda. Uh, that was an old hand. I'm, I'm so that's, hand. that's great. Thank you so much. So, uh, do you have anything else for us, Rachel? No, thank you. Okay, so uh, maybe, um, Sharon, if you could, uh, you know, separate the the attendees from the participants here for a minute again. That would be good. Okay. So any other questions or thoughts about the landscaping? Again, it looks great and really exciting to see the, um, the developments and really imagine uh, the beauty of the space on the outside. Okay. So next is an energy code update. Tim? Alan? Austin, that's yes. another. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'll, uh, Josephine and I will take this over. So right. we've met with our um, folks who are doing our Teddy modeling. Great. Uh, they are working diligently trying to wrap it up. We, we got some good news today. It doesn't look like it's significant changes, but we'll know a little bit more next week. Great. Um, there may be some tweaking of a little bit of the insulation, but we were so, you know, doing the EUIs as we were, we were so ahead of the game. It's helped us. So right. we will would like to just not give you an exact right now, but we'll we can report back to Sharon and Tim uh, next week. Uh, we hope uh, where we are, but it's it's looking positive. That's great. And uh, just to state what uh, was stated the other day in the board meeting of the Jones Library. Uh, as we've gone through the value engineering process, our sustainability goal, I just, Ellen and Tim want to make sure that you agree with this characterization, our energy and sustainability goals uh, played a prominent role in the value engineering process. Is that an accurate description? Well, if I wanted responses like this, <laughs> that feels like a little bit of a trick question. Um, so well, we went through, uh, it's not a trick question. We went through. No, I some, know it is yeah. some do some documents in the trustees meeting that when we went through the value engineering process, we were looking at sustainability. Yes. It wasn't like we just said forget the sustainability goals. We got a value um, engineer. No. Okay, I understand what you were asking. No, sustainability is embedded in this project and was not I, I i don't and just mean you can comment on this sustainability <laughs> was not on the chopping block that is right. embedded in the project it was and remains was and remains embedded in the project right and, and that's why we are so in such a good position with this new energy code absolutely. because we were pushing it right. we as a group were pushing it Right. And what remains to be seen is when you do your modeling, how close to our targets are we going to end up being? Is that accurate? That's accurate. So the Teddy model is is just one model that's required with the new energy code. Yep. The, um, tally. the tally, thank you, is separate and will be done after the Teddy. But we're feeling good about that. So. Right. We're feeling good about all of this. Would you agree, Josephine? Yeah, yeah, that's exact analysis. Tally will be done afterwards. And um, once we get our numbers back for the Teddy modeling, we can move on to the tally and continue on with the path that we were on. But 
with the numbers looking good, yeah, we feel pretty confident right now. So good. That's great. Good. To, that's good to hear. Okay. Any questions about the energy code update? Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Anything else from Colliers or FAA? No. No. Just. Well, I was just going to say one thing that we didn't talk about, and we'll talk about maybe at the next meeting. But um, as we're getting closer to um, wrapping up design and going into the bidding process, uh, we'll start with a, uh, a pre-qualification committee. Um, we'll be getting that together to start with pre-qualifying uh, contractors who are going to be uh, allowed to bid on the project. So we'll give you an update at the next meeting with that kind of timeline and what the requirements are by DKM that we're going to need to follow to go through that process. Great. Great. Okay. Well, again, thanks to FAA and thanks to Berkshire and thanks to Colliers um, uh, for your, uh, for, for your, for your work. Uh, design subcommittee, <laughs> Christy. Nothing to report. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, outreach, Alex. <laughs> um, nothing on outreach, but I did want to. Um, uh, one of our members of our sustainability committee, um, is actually in the participants, and I think that they, I don't know if they have a question or if they wanted to. So, what I was going to do is actually just go through the agenda and then invite public comment in the next in the next thing. Is that okay? okay. Yep. Yep. Works for me. Um, nothing, nothing from outreach. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. So uh, no correspondence uh, to address, no topics not anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance. Public comment. Todd? Hey, Hello, Todd. Library Committee. It's been a while. It's nice to see you. Thanks for coming. It's very nice to see you. And um, as always, uh, Austin, it's great to hear you compliment others on their involvement here. But every time I've had the um, opportunity to appear in front of this group, I've been grateful as a taxpayer in town to realize how competent the people working on this project are. And I'm grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. But, that aside, talking about some of the criticisms of the VE process, value engineering process, and knowing that the sustainability goals um, have been held in the EUI, could I just say a few things about my experience building buildings in, um, in other places, some very, very green buildings? Um, <coughs> the EUI is the measure of an environmentally forward and climate friendly building here. And the fact that that is still being talked about, I mean, 15, 20 years ago, when I mentioned the term EUI, people looked at me like I had two heads. And to hear it brought forward and discussed and maintained in every meeting is truly a wonderful thing. And it doesn't matter how you get there, um, whether you're using LEED certification or a living building challenge performance of the building is performance. Mm -hmm. um, and things like, you know, the sawtooth roof, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I don't have a big soft spot for putting a very low R value, very expensive roofing material on something that's going to let ultraviolet light into the building that books don't like. So I think that particularly was a very, very smart trade-off because um, you've taken a very low thermal performance material. That is nice for people to be able to see the, the daylight and everything, but th that's, that's a way to save money and increase the performance of the building. So I think that was a good one. And in evaluating the performance of the library against other buildings, um, I would just wanna bring to the committee's attention that a library, according to the CBEX database, which is uh, Department of Energy Maintenance <laughs> database of similar building types around the nation, how much energy they use and they calculate the EUI. The EUI of a library is almost 50% higher than that of a K to 12 school. Hmm. 
So fundamentally, this is a different problem we're trying to solve. You're trying to solve. I get to just kind of <laughs> help help you, uh, you know, put some guidelines out there. I won't take any credit for solving that problem. But yeah, so so you're trying to design a very efficient building that its baseline is 50% higher than other projects in town. And those other projects also have a much larger land footprint on which you could put PV panels or <laughs> other things to generate electricity, whereas this is a very large building on a very small space. And so that again is a fundamentally different problem you're trying to yeah. solve. And then finally, if I could just comment on geothermal or ground source versus the air source heat pumps that this building is moving forward. Um, it's very expensive to drill holes in the ground. Mm -hmm. Yes, Eversource will double their incentive for ground source on a per ton basis, but it goes from twelve hundred tons, twelve hundred dollars a ton, to twenty four hundred dollars a ton. When drilling the hole in the ground is going to cost about twenty thousand dollars a ton. Mm -hmm. So, while it makes up for a little bit of that cost, it makes up for maybe. 10, less than 10% of that cost. So it's a wonderful way to do it, um, particularly if you have a building that has a balance between the heating and cooling side. <coughs> An air source heat pump just does what you ask it to do. A ground source heat pump, you have to put as much heat into the ground as mm -hmm. you take out of the ground on a yearly basis, or you change the ground temperature. Mm -hmm. And if you have a heating dominated load, like you do with a library, you are going to gradually cool off the ground until you run the risk of freezing your wells. Hmm. So geothermal would have been a very expensive and difficult solution for this building in, in my opinion. Todd, you, you mentioned LEED certification. Yes. Um, so, at an early stage, I think advised by the Sustainability Committee, we decided not to pay a lot of attention to LEED certification. And I wonder if you could just remind us of the wisdom of that choice. My, my background is, is in um, high performance buildings at uh, colleges, um, mostly private colleges and LEED certification tool. Uh, LEED certification has often been um, dictated by the people donating the money. So they 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 want that um, as a, as kind of a, a quality check on what they have, but all of the private colleges that I've been involved with in the past are using a modified lead where they deliberately emphasize and slant it towards the performance end right. of it. Right. And so by by fixing the goals of what you want in a project like this, and not moving on them is is a different way to get that without the overhead and the fees associated with lead certification. Yeah, it's a tool yeah. to get what you want, but it's it's not a cheap tool. I don't mean right. to, to criticize it, but yeah. it it's not inexpensive, and it's a lot of bookkeeping. Yeah, and guided by the sustainability committee and your advice and the good work of people on this Zoom we have focused pretty directly on the performance of the building what we want to do is have a building that is as sustainable as it can be in its use and as well as in its uh, construction yes and in construction that's a great point austin because isn't this the first town building that has actually considered embodied carbon in the design part of it well i'm not going to represent i can't represent Okay, uh, what, what, uh, what I'll people throw that have... out there. If somebody wants yep. to tag me on, you know, yep. just throwing yep. that out there, I could be wrong, but I think it is. And this is um, one thing you need to, to, and it's specific to high performance buildings, because in the past, a building's carbon footprint has far and away been its operational carbon. Every year, the natural gas you buy to heat it and the electricity you buy to cool it and light it. Um, that footprint adds over adds up over time to be a much bigger part of its lifetime carbon footprint. But as you make more and more efficient buildings and you reduce that operational carbon 
And a lot of times you have to build that energy efficiency into the building. So you're adding more carbon intensive and more materials. Think of like replacing double pane windows with triple pane windows. Um, you know, that window assemble, assembly is more expensive, it's heavier, it's got more stuff in it, it mm -hmm. took more carbon to make. make it, yeah. So, you know, it becomes more important to consider what the embodied carbon is in the construction process on a high performance building. And I think this was kind of groundbreaking for the town to talk about it up front here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to just express my gratitude for everything you said, except what you said about the sore tooth roof, because <laughs> I remain whatever. But in any case, that's very, very helpful. I also want to just say, Todd, before you go, um, and really just to call out yet again our library director and Alex, that the Board of Trustees of the library did, I, I think, a kind of, I don't know if courageous is the right thing to say, but a kind of courageous thing, which is we convened a group of people who are going to hold our feet to the proverbial fire about sustainability. And um, I think the project is gazoodles of time better for it. And I just think um, what, you, what you and the members of the committee did and continue to do has kept this project on the target that we have all been dedicated to. So it's, I'm really grateful to Sharon and Alex who kind of led us to this relationship. And it was not an easy thing to do. Why do we need you people telling us, you know, like whether we're doing the right thing? After all, we don't know anything. We could make that decision ourselves. So it's been really great. And I appreciate your, your help. Okay, thank you, Todd. So any other member of the public wish to make a, ask a question, make a statement? Ginny Hamilton. <laughs> Hello. I want to take a minute just to go from the, the big picture to some of the, the little celebratory details um, and make sure that folks know about a concert series that's happening at the library this summer. Um, the librarians were contacted by um, Yoon So Lee, who's a high school student who lives in Amherst, who loves the library and is organizing a chamber music concert series for the Jones Library Building Project and Capital Campaign this summer. So um, information, I know Sharon emailed out the flyer. It's on the main page of the library's website. It will go in the um, email this week at the Jones this Saturday. But I wanted to raise it here because we focused a lot in our fundraising on the million dollar donors and the six figure donors and, and such. And the fact that this teen decided herself to recruit other young people to come play music, which is one of her loves um, yeah. at the library, which is yeah. another of her loves um, and do it for future generations of people at the library. I just think it's um, an important thing to highlight of how broad the support is for this project in town. So please look for the um, update on Tutti, which is the name of the series. If you happen to know any young people who play instruments, she's actually still looking to um, make room for more solos or, um, or small group ensembles. Um, and the first one happens a week from tomorrow, Friday afternoon um, at two. Um, and in fact, the, the, the point uh, that Gigi made earlier, rather than having it under the tent out front, they actually arranged today that this concert will be on the Historical Society's patio um, and benefiting. So right. um, sure. pretty awesome to see that happening. So thanks for letting me highlight it here. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks for the work that you do as well in support of the project. Okay. Any other public comment? All right. I see no, no virtual hands. Again, great thanks to FAA and Berkshire and Colliers um, for the work and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.